Okay, well, welcome back, particularly to our online viewers who are joining us again um, for this session after a short break. I hope you're feeling refreshed and ready to go. We are all ready to move on to our next session, and it's my pleasure to introduce Nathan Pinkney from the uh, People's Fundraising. He's the Chief Executive of People's Fundraising, who's going to give us a presentation about how to maximise fundraising income, supporter engagement versus supporter participation. Nathan, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's been a great morning so far, so uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how to maximise fundraising income, uh, the difference between supporter engagement and uh, supporter participation. Okay. So really this whole talk is going to talk about and reason over this graph here. Now, what this graph shows um, are the top... 10 most active charities on our uh, fundraising platform, peoplesfundraising.com, uh, since uh, uh, 2020, 21 into 23. Now, this is quite an interesting graph because it shows that the top 10 most active charities over pretty much when COVID was in uh, full swing have increased almost uh, uh, four times. Okay, And so if we look at we saw about three and a half thousand charities. If we look at the overall charity giving pattern, they're pretty similar to as been as what has been described throughout the morning, especially via Insuse and, and Zoe's excellent talk. So, what's happening here with these uh, particular very active charities? Okay. So, in order to understand this, I think we first need to take a, a step back into how we've come to this situation in the first place. Okay, so I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about really the, the evolution of individual, community, and corporate fundraising um, as we've seen it um, evolve over really the last 10 years, and that's essentially in three phases. Um, the first phase is the donation ask, then we're going to talk about the fundraising ask, and then extending that more engaging supporter experiences. And we see charities, especially uh, when a, a charity is initially formed, small, medium-sized charities, they generally go through this, these phases of individual community and corporate fundraising. Okay, so what is uh, uh, the donation ask? So essentially the donation ask is simply when you as a charity, you go out to your uh, fundraising networks and you ask for donations quite simply you're doing something amazing something to you know make the world a better place again you go out to that individual community and corporate network and you ask for donations so however um, to base your your fundraising on that is essentially limits uh, it limits you and it ends up in what's called donation fatigue so donation fatigue is where your fundraising network essentially doesn't have the means or inclination to just keep on donating uh, to you. Okay? And again, we see these especially with, with smaller charities. So once a charity realizes that donation fatigue is a, a real phenomenon, then we have the next phase of uh, charity fundraising, and that's the fundraising ask. So this is a, a slightly different way of uh, you engaging with your supporters. So instead of going out and asking your supporter base for donations, you then go out to your supporter base and you say, well, why don't you do a marathon run or a cake bake? Okay, so you know, one would typically set up a, a fundraising page on people's fundraising or Just Giving or one of these many other platforms. And again, this is a, a really good way um, um, of generating money uh, for uh, a charity. However, again, it still limits you in your potential for overall income generation. So again, you've got the, the concepts of uh, donation fatigue and lack of network reach. So what is donation fatigue in this context? So if I do a marathon run, you know, my family and friends would be pretty amazed in the first place, um, but they will donate to my donation page. But if I keep on doing the same, you know, a marathon run two, three times uh, over the year, that same family, friends and colleague network will give me less money over time. So they, they are fatigued. They're not so impressed that I can, you know, run multiple marathons. But also lack, uh, lack of network reach. Again, we, we see this as a, as a big problem for charities, and we've seen it uh, being described in talks previously. 
So if you, you essentially go to your office and you say, how many people are actually going to do a marathon run or cake bake? you will find that very few people are actually going to do it. Irrespective may have the, ten the intention, the actuality of doing that is relatively small. And I think the statistics earlier on today, in one in five people are actually going to do something like that. So if you base your fundraising efforts on asking for donations, donation fatigue kicks in there, or uh, asking your supporter base and go out and do these events, Again, your donation fatigue is going to kick in, but again, you're really not going to capture or engage your supporter base uh, as fully as you could. Okay. So then, what what to charities? What's the next stage for charities? Okay. Now we see over the last couple of years, charities are realizing that they spend so much energy. Uh, and time um, understanding their supporter base but not really getting the return of the investment. So they look for more engaging supporter experiences. And we really see these with you know, charities. You know, if you go to charities' websites, a lot of them now saying, why don't you enter our, our lottery or our raffle? And again, that, that's a good thing. The reason why that is a good thing is that um, it's a different type of engagement. It's a different experience um, that your supporter base can interact with, and hence you'll get uh, some more funding. And again, what we see on our platform, you'll have a certain demographic that will donate, you will have another demographic that may do a fundraising event, and you will have a slightly different demographic who will maybe you know, uh, enter a raffle or a lottery. Okay. However, again, with that as well, we are seeing a couple of systematic issues that are being built up for charities as they want to engage more of their supporter base um, and, again, generate more fundraising income. So the, th the three primary issues we're seeing are low brand awareness, uh, high management costs of, and lack of data ownership. So what do we mean by low brand awareness? So... Um, Again, as a proactive charity, you're going to go and sign up with the, the raffle system or the lottery system, the fundraising system. And as soon as you direct your supporters out you know, from your website or from your social media presence, they're now in a different look and feel. Okay? When they make a donation, when they buy the lottery ticket, they're going to get an email, not from you, but from the underlying platform provider. And again... You know, this is a, an opportunity lost in order to develop your brand awareness, uh, develop that relationship with your supporters through that brand, uh, brand awareness as well. However, you're still trying to engage more with more experiences, but the negative is loss of brand awareness. Also, high management costs as well. Um, if you're um, uh, somebody who works in the back office and, and your fundraising team comes to you and they, says, uh, they say, look, we want to you know, sign up with this great new raffle system or lottery system, your first reaction is probably, oh, no, another little integration we need to do. Again, that's timely, that's costly. Um, you, know, you have low data insights. You, know, you need to pull the data from yet another system. So the more you expand out into more engaging experiences, um, you always keep note of there is a corresponding back-end management cost as well that you need to reconcile in and factor into your overall fundraising budget. And also loss of data ownership and, and whatnot. So again, if you fundraise primarily on uh, Just Giving, Just Giving own that data, you don't own that data, they analyze it, you get a subset of that data. And it's the same with any other of these uh, platforms as well. You're essentially you losing your data um, uh, and also the management of that data as well. So again, it's something that charities more and more do. They want to engage their supporter base with more uh, experiences. However, there is a negative side uh, to that as well. Okay, so let's go, go back now to what we are seeing over our platform. Um, so again, we support uh, over 3,500 small to medium-sized charities and, and some of the large uh, charities. Um, and we're seeing 
two distinct modes of fundraising evolving. Um, again, they're specializations of what we've seen in the past. And we term these supporter engagement and supporter participation. And so what are these? And again, we're, we, we want to bring these terms out into the fore because we think it's important for charities here to understand what they are and such that they can focus on them for, you know, greater fundraising income generation. Okay, so supporter engagement is simply where you as a charity, your fundraising team, understand your individual and community and corporate networks, and you go out to your supporter base and you say, do you want to make a donation to us? Do you want to enter a raffle? Uh, do you want to enter the lottery? Whereas supporter participation is a slightly different interaction and conversation uh, with your supporter base. So instead of inviting them to make a donation or enter the raffle, you're now inviting them to set up a fundraising page or to set up a raffle page or a donation page, etc. And it's a diff slightly different way in a specialization of viewing fundraising. In one context, your fundraising team are driving the interactions and engagement with your supporter base. And in the, the second supporter participation paradigm, you're empowering your supporter base to essentially be an extension of your own fundraising team. And this is where we see the biggest growth in fundraising income. Now, if you think about it, if your fundraising team is made up of three individuals, those three individuals can generate just say 10 different fundraising experiences over the year. But, but your charity has 100 uh, supporters. Those 100 supporters can potentially generate far more ex fundraising experiences with their own family and friends compared to your own uh, charity fundraising team. Okay. So let's now uh, revisit this, this graph again with the understanding and the differentiation between supporter engagement and supporter participation. So remember, these are the top 10 most active uh, charities on our platform. And this is a, a, what we are seeing more as a, a typical trend as supporters understand the difference between the two and they reorganize their fundraising teams to enable the two. Okay, so on the left-hand side, you've got um, a typical charity um, undertaking supporter engagement using typical fundraising tools. So the blue down there is asking for donations, the orange are the fundraisers, and the gray are fundraising events. Again, all of the type of fundraising experiences we've talked about so far throughout the day. You know, uh, please make a donation to us, go out and do it a cake bake marathon run, enter a you know, Tough Mudder or marathon type um, uh, race. Okay, so, the, so for the following year, what our platform has enabled those charities to do is to extend out their in sport or engagement, but on top of using uh, those typical tools, they're now what we call enhanced support or engagement, whereby they are using things like auctions, and raffles and memberships or sponsorships. Um, raffles is a very, very popular tool for uh, charities. It's probably you know, the third most uh, popular tool. Uh, we've been very surprised by the prominence of auctions as well. Now, the key thing with these different fundraising experiences is when you're engaging with your supporter base, you want to understand your supporter base, understand how they want to be engaged with, okay? So remember, some de demographics or some uh, um, areas or some, yeah, some demographics will just simply want to donate and forget about it. But a lot of your supporters, we're finding, want you to develop a relationship with your supporters and give them a corresponding experience aligned with their preferences. And so this is why we believe that those there's an increase in the use of other fundraising experiences such as auctions and raffles. Okay? Now, if we move to the, the, the year 2022, um, we've got, again, a significant increase 
um, donation fundraising and events are increasing slightly. But there's a, a jump in the use of, again, raffles, and we've got a, f a few other um, revenue streams coming online, vouchers and shops as well. Now, when we looked at the data, what we found out was that in the, in the year uh, 20 and 21, the charity was solely engaged in supporter engagement, but by the time they, or towards the end of 21, 22, um, the difference was is the charities were now asking their supporters to, instead of just making a donation or setting up a fundraising page, that they could also set up their own raffle page or auction page or shop or gift voucher page to support the fundraising effort. And, um, yeah, the results are, you know, really quite interesting. From a charity perspective, don't just limit your engagement to what you think your supporters want to uh, consume. So don't just say you can just do a Tough Mudder race or donate to us. Empower them to do things that you probably haven't even thought um, they would do in the first place. And this is what we're seeing in the, in the increase... Uh, in year uh, 22. It's really quite interesting. Okay, so just to paraphrase, just a few points from that, uh, what we take from that. Both approaches require the fundraising team to understand their supporter base demographic fit. Now, what we've seen is not all charities will have a demographic that will go out and actively fundraise for them. Some demographics want to be engaged with. Some demographics will just, you know, take the tools you offer them and just go off and do their own fundraising. So you really need to understand uh, the dem demographic fit. And that's also from not only the fundraising experience, so if that's a donation page or an auction page or a shop page or a gift voucher page, but that's also the channel in which you engage them uh, from. So remember, it's really important to understand your supporter base from the experiences and channel. What do I mean by channel? Whether you're engaging them through your website or different social media channels or via email or via physical mail. For example, if you're primarily engaged in interacting with your supporter base via Facebook as opposed to TikTok, you know your demographic is slightly older you know, et cetera, et cetera. So really understand your demographic, develop that relationship, understand who they are with respect to how you engage with them over the channels and also the relevant fundraising experiences as well. Um, but also, uh, both approaches require the fundraising team to interact the supporter base in a different way. I think I've just covered that in actual fact. So um, just take your website, for example. A lot of charity websites have a donate button in the top right-hand corner. If you click on the support us, a lot of charity websites will say, you know, why don't you, you know, do this marathon run or this tough mother thing. Um, again, that's really focused on um, just two types of fundraising streams, okay, donations and fundraisers. So how you interact with them, how you empower your supporters be more flexible. So now we're in the paradigm now of, especially from the supporter participation perspective, instead of saying to your supporters, yes, do a fundraiser or make a donation to us, you can now say, why don't you set up your own uh, membership page or raffle page or auction page and really allow them to engage with you as well. Okay. However, um, watch out for the pitfalls of low brand awareness. Again, we think it's all about you developing a relationship with your um, uh, supporter base. And if you are a small, especially medium-sized charity and you've, you've created your charity from the ground up, if you are interested in, in doing that activity, then there's going to be a community as well who would like to support you as well. So it's really important to tap into that community. Corporate-type charities, they undertake fundraising a lot of time in a slightly different way. They undertake fundraising as a, in a transactional way. They put an advert, an anonymous advert out on the tube station or something like that. People will make a donation. It would be a direct donor, uh, for example, regular donation. For small and medium-sized charities, it's a different paradigm. And we, we find the most effective way is 
get to know your particular community, engage with your community, understand how, over what channels they want to be interacted with, but also understand what experiences they want to have in the context of fundraising as well. Um, yeah, so watch out for the pitfalls of low brand awareness, high management costs, and loss of uh, data ownership as you progress through this path, okay? We really see this as, a, as a, the, the next wave or generation of fundraising. It's just recognizing you need to have more of a relationship with your fundraisers, okay? And empower them, enable them uh, to fundraise with you or for you with relevant fundraising experiences, okay? Right, so uh, just uh, uh, lastly, how we can help you. Um, so we are a charity ourselves. We're an infrastructure charity, and uh, we can support you. We have a, a, a branded charity platform. Um, through our platform, uh, you can enable support engagement participation. Our platform provides donation pages, individual, individual and team fundraisers, raffles, events, auctions, lottery, gift vouchers, and shops all within one platform, low management costs, it's a pay-as-you-go model, no upfront fees, uh, it's got a lower cost, total cost of ownership than just giving, and it is end-to-end -end charity branded. And that's it. Hopefully you found that uh, quite interesting. And again, we've really tried to communicate today, it's all about know your supporter and give them the fundraising experiences that suit that demographic. Thank you. Nathan, great. Thank you very much for that. I wonder if anybody has a question for Nathan just before we round this session off. Maybe he does. Well, I'm going to ask you one. I just wondered, in terms of the data that you're seeing on your platform, what sort of trends are you seeing in terms of the, the sort of fundraising activities that, that are going well at the moment that, that maybe are kind of catching the imagination of people that, that charities here might be able to encourage people to take part in? Um, I don't think we look at it from that way because um, we provide a platform that has about like eight, eight or nine different tools. What we focus on are not what, for example, events people are interested in. So when somebody creates a fundraising event, is it for the London Marathon or is it for a cake bake or something like that? But we generally focus on how people use the tools. Okay, and um, again, hopefully from, from uh, what I spoke about uh, uh, through my presentation is that charities and are simply realizing that they need to provide more engaging fundraising experiences to their supporters or empower them to have more fundraising experiences through tools such as raffles, super popular, auctions, su super popular, slightly lagging behind our memberships um, and then shops and gift vouchers, for example. Right. One of our um, online viewers has asked, can you re recommend any tools that can help charities maximise supporter engagement and participation, given our limited time and staffing resources? Yeah, peoplesfundraising.com. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a fully branded platform offering all of those tools, pay as you go, uh, low, lower to uh, total cost of ownership than a just giving account. So. Yeah, please check out peoplesfundraising.com. <laughs> that, uh, that almost feels like a planted question. Yeah, that wasn't us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, that's all we've got time for for that particular thank session. You. But Nathan Pickney, thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much.